I wish you God's blessings as I welcome you to another episode of Living Emmaus, a program serialized to explain the meaning and significance of the Holy Eucharist and to enhance the understanding of our faithful and enable them, you, our viewers, to experience the risen Lord in the Holy Eucharist. So uh, we have been talking about in our previous program uh, about the uh, preparation of the altar and today we will be talking about another important part of the liturgy of the Eucharist and to do that once again we have with us Reverend Father Cecil Joy Pereira, the uh, director of the uh, Daham Seven Seminary in Kalutara and he was the former Archdiocesan Director of Sacred Liturgy. And welcome, Father Cecil Joy, once again to Living Emmaus. Thank you very much, Trevor. So, Father, let's uh, take off from where we left. And that is, uh, we came up to the preparation of the altar. We talked about the various uh, items uh, that are on the altar and what should and should not be on the altar. And now we are ready to go into another important part. I think uh, a very lengthy part, I would say, where the faithful are just uh, more or less, you know, uh, looking and uh, uh, watching what's happening on the altar and the priest goes on with a long lengthy prayer a lengthy <laughs> prayer I would say uh, sometimes uh, I don't know whether the faithful actually focus on what's happening there during that time what's that lengthy prayer it's all about father the most important prayer okay that is the most important prayer the Eucharistic prayer so that's the Eucharistic prayer. That's the right. Eucharistic prayer. Why is it so long and, you know, <laughs> what are the significance of it, sir? Now you are uh, saying that people are inert and they are wondering what's going on. Right. Except when the bell rings, mm -hmm. they are so uh, devout and then they, uh, above their heads, they kneel. But if you... Uh, take, for example, the liturgy of the word, the priest also was rather, you know, inactive, no? Inactive, yes. We said that some time <laughs> ago in our episode previously. Yes. Then the celebrant was, uh, you know, observing yeah. what was going on. Yeah. Now it is the turn of the people. Okay. Not, not that we are trying to bring in a contest here. Mm -hmm. But uh, jokes apart, mm -hmm. this is the most important prayer the central prayer and this is what our people especially you know when they come for mass they really don't understand what's going on yeah. and uh, it looks as if they are also not interested in knowing what's going on and perhaps feel disconnected, disconnected from what's happening yes, in the altar yes hmm? they are disconnected disinterested hmm. Hmm. And uh, they are rather indifferent, except mm -hmm. when the bell rings, of yeah. course, there is a lot of fervor. Yeah. Now, uh, you have to understand that both the liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Eucharist are predominantly Jewish rites. Mm. The liturgy of the Word, we said, uh, comes from the synagogal tradition, yeah. right? Of reading out the Torah, mm -hmm. the law of Moses and the prophets. Mm. Now we have the ritual of the Passover mm. enacted mainly at home, you know, home liturgy. Even today, Trevor, in uh, the homes of Orthodox Jews, the Passover Seda, the Passover meal takes place. Takes place, yeah. Right? Jesus being a, a Jew, an Orthodox faithful Jew, he also prepared the Passover meal. Hmm. So he also knew all the history from Exodus onwards. Right. Of course, now there was uh, this huge decisive uh, transition, transformation. Hmm. He himself became uh, the Paschal Lamb. Mm -hmm. right? There was no need of another lamb. Yeah. He himself was the lamb. And he himself became the priest. He himself became the altar of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. There are traditions that he took from his Jewish uh, ancestry and then brought into this Last Supper table. 
and accomplished on the following day on Mount Calvary. Yes. So these are things that are inseparable, right? Mm. If you notice, what happens during the Eucharistic prayer is a kind of a bloodless uh, reenactment mm. of what happened on Monday Thursday evening and Good Friday afternoon. Mm. Both combined together, mixed together. You cannot separate them. That's why on every altar there is a crucifix. The crucifix representing the Good Friday yeah. and the table of the banquet representing uh, what happened on uh, Monday Thursday evening. Mm. Now this prayer, long prayer, you said it's a long prayer, it's a long prayer. Actually it is, it should be longer, it mm -hmm. should be longer. If you go to a Jewish home, even today, they have this Passover meal very faithfully celebrated. Yeah. In fact, uh, there are about 14 different stages, 14 mm. different stages. Mm. And it's really beautiful, you know, absorbing and also somewhat dramatic. Yeah. Reminiscent of uh, what they went through. In Egypt, their liberation, the, the lamb and the bitter herbs and uh, wine and all that, you know, unleavened bread, all that is hmm. uh, there. Now, for example, uh, in a Jewish Passover meal, there are four different cups. Right. Okay. When you say cups, cups of wine. Wine, yeah, certainly. Because these are actually reminiscent or uh, reenacting certain stages of this whole experience. Okay. It's an experience of true liberation for the people. Hmm. For example, there is what is called the Kiddish, the cup of sanctification. Hmm. Then there is the Haggadah. The story, yeah. they tell the whole story. Hmm. Then there is the cup of blessing and the cup of praise. Actually, what happens during the Eucharistic celebration and what is recorded in the Gospels during hmm. the Last Supper refers to this third cup, the cup of right. blessing. Cup of blessing. Hmm. The cup of blessing. Now, this will take me to a little bit of history. Mm -hmm. I think uh, our weavers, our faithful, must know this story. Mm -hmm. Now, for Jews, meals are sacred. Yeah. All meals are sacred. Mm -hmm. For them, every meal reminded uh, to them about God's benevolence, especially mm -hmm. bread reminded to them about God's magnanimity. So they gave thanks. Mm -hmm. It was natural, spontaneous that they give thanks. There are some very important prayers here, blessings here, that they proclaim, that they pronounce. There is the most important one, which is said after the cup of blessing. Mm -hmm. It's called Birkat HaMatzon. That's Hebrew, right? That's Hebrew, yeah. right? The prayer after the cup of blessing. Yeah. Actually, the Eucharistic prayer is only a kind of a representation of that. Okay. Right, even that is very long. Mm. I mean, long in, in our way of our reckoning way of that, you know. Mm. Now, what is Birkat Hamad song is that uh, they give praise to God for the land, for the food, and for Jerusalem, mm. right? Because Jerusalem is their holy city. Correct. So for the land, they give praise because it is the land which is fertile. You know that originally they were deserts, very arid, very dry uh, areas. Somehow, you know, as the prophet says, the desert now, you know, begins to really uh, produce uh, 
uh, an abundance of the harvest mm. because of God's goodness. So they gave thanks to God for the land and for the food mm -hmm. and also always a prayer for Jerusalem. Mm. This Birkat Hama song or this prayer of blessing after this third cup is what uh, forms the framework of the Eucharistic prayer. Mm -mm. So we must remember that this is not a prayer which is actually composed and written by some Pope somewhere mm. down in the history. Yeah. But this is our Jewish tradition of mm. May glorifying God, of blessing God, of thanking and praising Him for these gifts. Right. In fact, Eucharist from the Greek roots means giving thanks. Hmm. Eucharistia, Eucharistain, they are Greek words, Eucharistain, Eucharistia, which means give thanks. give thanks. There is another Greek word we use for this prayer called the anaphora. Mm -hmm. Anaphora is that you lift up, lift up your you know, praises to God. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, it's totally as, uh, you know, if you in, take it in summary form, it is praising God for this act of redemption. Right. Now, if you take the Jewish Birkat Hama song and take also the earliest Christian writings, such as the Didache, right? Didache is uh, very, very uh, important in this discussion. Mm. Didache is a, is a very ancient uh, document we have uh, from the uh, late first century, right, towards yeah. the end of the first century, where you find a kind of a parallel uh, to the Jewish Birkat Hama song. Mm -hmm. Right. In fact, uh, liturgy scholars would say what is found in the Didache is a development, is a kind of a, you know, it's an offshoot or either development uh, of the Jewish mm. prayer. So here we have uh, in the Eucharistic prayer uh, a, a blessing over the bread, a blessing over the cup mm. and a prayer for the church, right. Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And the church. And the church. Right. And the church. Mm. So, in other words, Didache's uh, Eucharistic prayer is called the Birkat Hama song of the Christian community. Mm -mm. Right. So, once you have this uh, embellished, right, developed, you have the Eucharistic prayer. Mm. Right. So, I'm just, uh, without going into all the technical details, I'm trying to know, create this uh, or lay this foundation mm. so that we understand why this prayer is long and why this prayer is so special, why this prayer is so central and why this prayer is so traditional, mm -hmm. right? So it is not my creation, it is not your creation, it is not creation, it is not a creation by any single personality, mm -hmm. but it is the sacred tradition of blessing and thanking and glorifying God that we have, that we are continuing now with Jesus at the center. Mm. And that is why probably it's not right for priests to improvise exactly. the prayers exactly. on their own. Right, you hit the nail right on the head now. Thank you for that. And now uh, people begin to wonder no, mm. why we are so glued to glued our to books. Book books and then we are very, very careful to turn the pages. Sometimes when uh, uh, the, the celebrant misses the page, the concelebrant or the deacon would assist and put the page, <laughs> yeah. uh, page right mm. and then uh, we are so mm. glued to the book, we won't take our eyes off that, we are so faithful to the text. Why? Yeah. And as you rightly said, it's not proper for us to improvise. Mm. It is not proper. It's, it has to be very clearly stated, uh, much as uh, I am very skilled, maybe I am very clever, I am brilliant and very fluent in my uh, expressions, I could close my eyes and then uh, improvise a prayer. Hmm. 
just to thank God for whatever is here, for whatever he has given that, but no, that's not allowed. Hmm. Simply not allowed. And then we as priests must be modest and humble enough to really accept that we are not the masters, but that we are only ministers. Right. Right, we are not the masters, we are only ministers because we are not, uh, you know, above this right. Improvising has already been done by the law master himself. Yes, at the institution it, has, of it the has already been done. Now, Trevor, to uh, explain this, I, I personally introduced uh, three T's, right? This is uh, my own, my mm -hmm. personal way of presenting this. Did you say three T's? T, 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 T's, okay. T's, T's means not a cup of tea, but yeah. letter T. The alphabet. Letter T, right. yes. First T is that it is traditional. That mm -hmm. part I have already explained, how yeah. it comes from the Jewish tradition of the Passover mm -hmm. Seder and the Birkat Hama song, that prayer with, the, with its uh, different parts. Mm. That is why it is called traditional, right? Not uh, to mean that it is uh, hackneyed uh, or very old or outdated, not mm. in that sense. But it has the sacred tradition uh, which continues within that. That's why it right. is traditional. Mm. Then it is very theological. Mm -hmm. It's highly theological. Anaphora is, for example, we say a theocentric prayer. That means centered on the Father. It has also the Christological elements, then the pneumatological elements, which are rather, you know, technical, theological, lot of theology, lot of theology and beautiful, deep, rich theology. Hmm. Then the third is that it is technical okay. because it has a structure, a set structure, hmm. right? Unless we know this structure, we are not going to do justice to this Birkatama song the Christian version of the Birkat Hama song, hmm. right? It's like, you know, supposing we are given something for repair, right? And if I'm not aware of the inner mechanism, and if I start meddling with that with, without knowing it, hmm. supposing it's a car engine, yeah. and if I'm not the right man, Right, if I start meddling with this and that and that wire and this screw and this wheel, right, then I might mess up the whole engine. Absolutely. Because there is a mechanism. Hmm. Similarly, the Eucharistic prayer is so technical. It has its own structure mm -hmm. and the structure is already well defined. Mm -hmm. And uh, without uh, knowing the structure, if you start meddling with that, putting this here and putting the other thing there, hmm. we are really, you know, destroying the whole prayer. Okay. That is why priests are very earnestly urged, hmm. actually not earnestly urged, they are not allowed hmm. to change anything of this prayer. Hmm. Right. And uh, if we are really, really humble, receptive, we will continue what has been done in the church? Mm. Because the church knows better, right. right? Supposing I think that I know better than the church, right? Then I know uh, that this is now irrelevant. Therefore, I uh, know, put in my uh, pinch of salt mm. uh, into this to make it uh, you know, more tasty and uh, more spicy then of course, uh, you know, mm. I need to really rethink mm. my own spirituality, right. you know, priestly spirituality. Priestly spirituality does not mean that I really push myself forward and uh, show that I am really skilled and uh, better than uh, what is found there and that uh, I am wiser than uh, the church herself. And also it's important that the our faithful understand that, that yes, there, should, yes. there shouldn't be any improvisation and that there is a purpose and a structure, as you said. Maybe yes. we could build on this uh, structure. Yeah, of course. Now. Of course, now I will be building on the structure. Mm -hmm. I will be building on a little bit of theology as mm -hmm. well because I now very briefly explained to you the the traditional, traditional part of part, it, yes, yes. how from yes, the, the Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, Passover yeah. Seder it comes. Mm. Uh, I hope you get uh, at least an idea of mm. it because uh, 
this type of discussion is not the place for me to go into great detail. Yeah. If we have a theology course, in fact, we do that. Mm. Uh, now, I teach uh, liturgical theology at the Singhala Theologate, and okay. then this is one subject. Mm -hmm. The Eucharistic prayer, we study for six months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we study it for six months, right? right? Because you can go into great detail about mm. this, into all the nitty gritties of the you know, Jewish Passover Seder mm. and the 14 different stages and so on. Right. Now, coming to the theology, now you see that there is a, a very, very deep and well-defined theological framework. Mm. Now, number one is that it is father-centered. Okay. It is always addressed to the father, father, except in one or two places within the prayer, like the anamnesis, mm. right? Other than that, it is totally centered on the father. Yeah. Addressed always to the Father. We always start with Father. You are holy indeed. Mm. Right? And how do we end with the doxology? Through Him, with Him, in Him. O God, Almighty Father. Father. To whom is this? To the Father. Mm. Through the Son, with the Son, in the Son. Uh, through the, the Son. Yes. And then uh, in the Holy Spirit, it is to the Father. Even the words of uh, consecration, the narrative, the institution narrative, if you notice, uh, my dear weavers, is addressed to the father, yes. not to the son. Mm. Not to the son. So this is a kind of a theological theme we have there. This prayer is what we call a theocentric or father-centered prayer. But then there are also Christological elements. Mm like the mystery of faith we proclaim, yeah. the passion, death and the resurrection of the Lord, mm -hmm. like the anamnesis, we will tell you what anamnesis is when we come to the structure. Uh, those are Christological moments. Uh, the Sanctus? Sanctus yes. is actually prior to that part of the, uh, what comes in between the preface, preface, and, the, and, the preface and the Eucharistic, prayer. the mm -hmm. body of the Eucharistic prayer. Mm -hmm. We will come to that when we talk about the structure. Okay. Then also, what, what we, there is the third element called the new metallurgical element or the work of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Especially, we talk about the epiclesis. These are Greek words, uh, technical terms, but uh, they are not difficult to understand. If you ever hear the word epiclesis, that is the working of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Right? Now, you would have seen the priest bringing his hands down like this. Over the gifts. Over the gifts, yes. And then the altar server ringing the bell at that time. Yeah. Then you know something important is going to happen. Mm. That's a moment of epiclesis. It doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is inactive at other moments, but this is a, a moment which is highlighted mm. and which has its own theology. We will once again discuss that when we come to the structure. So the work of the Holy Spirit, in fact, without the work of the Holy Spirit, this is not possible. Hmm. You know, uh, I remember going into a church in Germany some, some years ago in Neumarkt, and I was uh, so uh, uh, impressed by the sanctuary they had done. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have the altar there, and above the altar, there is the figure of the dove suspended with chains, but quite big, mm. right? And that is where they have uh, reserved the Blessed Sacrament also. So the Holy Spirit working on the gifts here, yes. right mm. above yeah. the altar. In fact, uh, in ancient churches, that was very common. Mm. Mm. Now, we tend to forget the role of the Holy Spirit in this whole thing mm. because uh, we don't see even uh, symbolism, symbolism there, mm. no artwork there. So it looks as if the Holy Spirit is totally forgotten there, mm. which, which is not at all right. No. Then we have what is called the anamnesis. Anamnesis is really making present in this present moment what happened long ago. Hmm. It is here and now and very much alive, right? Hmm. Making this 
a real experience of the present moment yeah. a moment in salvation history hmm. right then also we have the communion of saints now if you if you listen to this eucharistic prayer very carefully after the words of consecration uh, towards the second part you have the whole communion of saints yeah right you have the blessed mother the the the, the martyrs the apostles mm. then you have the dear departed you have the church leaders yeah right mm. the, the communion Father. of saints you remember in the birkatama song a prayer for jerusalem yes this is the parallel to this prayer a the prayer church. for the church right because now jerusalem the the, the pilgrim church is now the church mm. pilgrim uh, community is now the church mm. so there there is a prayer for the for the church here mm. right then finally we also have what is called uh, in uh, theology the eschatological expectation that means one day we hope one day we all hope that with the blessed virgin mary the apostles and the saints that we would enjoy this heavenly bliss right. that is how it ends hmm. that is how it ends therefore there are certain theological concepts which are really making this prayer very rich and holy mm-hmm. so that is the the other t yeah. right theological. so traditional theological, theological now we come to the structure technical technical part hmm. of it now the structure is rather complex i would say hmm. because this prayer is long and this prayer is very holy the mm. prayer is very central mm. and the prayer has the tradition and the theology there is a structure the structure is a result of those two mm-hmm. why is there a structure because yeah. it has to hold the theology and the tradition mm. otherwise everything crumbles Collapse, no yeah. mm. it's it's like the skeleton mm. right without the skeleton the body wouldn't stand we will just uh, you know uh, crumble down to the to the ground no mm. therefore we have this structure and then it's important that at least the main parts are recognized by our people right now for example starting from the preface mm. that is easy to understand the lord be with you lift up your hearts yeah right let us give thanks to the lord our god mm. we have heard this you know hundreds of times right. no if not more right now that is the beginning of the preface mm-hmm. actually the preface was supposed to be in history a prophetic proclamation mm-hmm. a prayer before the lord a prayer which initiates praising god a prayer which initiates thanksgiving Mm. right and if you take the body of the preface there are many prefaces for example if today is a week day for week days we have separate prefaces for sundays we have separate prefaces mm. let's say for the blessed virgin mary we have separate yeah. ones for martyrs we have separate ones then uh, for women saints we would have a separate one then uh, uh for devotional feasts like the eucharist we have separate ones mm. no we have if you take a preface there are three parts within that mm-hmm. right now i am not going to actually analyze the dialogue the dialogue also can be analyzed but i think it will be a little too much going into all that let's take the body of the preface but it's good for our people to know you will always hear that it is you know right and just and you no know, that we in the first part of the preface say that it is right it is just and it is redemptive salvific yeah we acknowledge that that going through this prayer and this ritual right which represents the passover meal and the sacrifice is right it is just and it is also redemptive it is yeah. salvific mm. okay the second part is the body of the preface which gives the reason for praising god mm. for example if it is uh, a feast of the blessed mother mm. 
Yeah. That part will give the reason why we are praising God, right? Because of the Blessed Virgin Mother. Right. That is the theological premise giving the reasons for praise. Mm. And the final part is leading up to Gloria. Asking all the saints and the angels, the seraphims and all these heavenly chorus of praise. The Sanctus we are this, to, right? No, we are, we are leading up to the Sanctus. That is called the Pre-Sanctus. The Pre-Sanctus. Pre-Sanctus, mm. right. So we have three parts. See, now the structure is mm. rather complex. It is. So unless we know this, okay, you saying, oh, right, you say anything and anything. No, no, not anything and everything is not possible. <laughs> anything and everything is not possible. It's possible. Right. And uh, we, we actually join the heavenly chorus of praise in their, in their song of mm. joy, their song of praise. And mm. that is based on Isaiah chapter 6, mm. holy, 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 yes. sanctus. Originally, if you go to the history, I don't want to go too much into the history, it could be a little heavy, but just let me mention one thing. Uh, as early as, uh, let's say, the third century, hmm, we have uh, the Eucharistic prayer mentioned in, uh, in the apostolic tradition uh, of Hippolytus, and uh, you have this whole thing there. Except the Sanctus. Sanctus mm. is not there. Mm. If you take the second Eucharistic prayer, which is normally said on weekdays and sometimes even on Sundays. The shortest on, one, I think. The shortest yes. one, yeah. uh, which is not proper for Sundays, but it is meant for weekdays. Mm. It is more or less found there. Okay. In the third century, mm. without the Holy Holy. Holy Holy was a late addition and therefore it became a kind of a, you know, a prayer that separated the, the preface from the body of the Eucharistic prayer. Yeah. Okay. Then we have what is called the affirmation of God's holiness. You are holy indeed. Hmm. Lord, you are holy indeed. Right. Right, affirmation. That is called the post-sanctus, what comes after the sanctus. Hmm. The next one is what is called the invocation of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Uh, you would have seen, no? The priest doing now uh, uh, that he comes down as dew, dew. right? Mm. And uh, then we make the sign of the cross that they may become the body and blood mm. of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is that the point where the species changed into the body and blood of Christ? Because some people have a confusion <laughs> of that and uh, elevation. Yeah, no, so there no, is, no. We need to understand exactly at yes. what point does the species turn into the body and blood of Christ. Yeah, this is not magic. This is, my dear brothers and sisters, is not magic. This is mystery. Yes. There is a huge difference between magic and mystery. Hmm. Right. I'm very thankful to you for bringing in this question. Uh, at which point? The whole Eucharistic prayer is consecratory. Mm -hmm. So you don't actually point and boil down to one magical point and say, this is the moment. Right. No, it's not right. It's not theologically sound. The whole Eucharistic prayer is consecratory. Right. Mm -hmm. So you don't say, okay, when the priest is bringing down his, uh, you know, hands over the gifts, that is the moment. So you you bury your head <laughs> mm -hmm. within your, you know, hands or arms. No, that's not the that's not a very good theology. Right. Right. Or now the priest is proclaiming the words of consecration. This is my body, and that is the moment. This host is now turning into the body of the Lord. It's not very sound theology. Mm -hmm. Of course, these are, uh, I would say, very important moments. Integral parts of the Definitely. consecratory. Yeah, but prayer. then it doesn't mean that you limit uh, the whole experience of the transubstantiation into one particular moment. Mm. Right. So I as, the con I, as the celebrant, cannot tell the people, uh, dear brothers and sisters, now, Look, this is the moment. Mm. This mm. is the moment. 
right you know you dramatize and over dramatize yeah. and mm. you exaggerate and then the people become very 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 zealous uh, very devout and they know keep their hands joined together sometimes they prostrate and all that then what about the eucharistic prayer mm. right do we forget that there were four cups here are we going to you know um go against the uh, the jewish prayers of birkat hamas on the full full uh, mm. uh, ritual no full right no we can't we so can't. in other words father you're saying that the entire eucharistic prayer is a consecratory prayer is consecratory mm. right these moments are very special right these moments are very special right it, it, it doesn't mean to say that they can be the only moment mm. right therefore that that's the idea we have yeah, given yeah. rather unfortunately mm. right. that's the idea we mm. have given so much so that after the elevation of the chalice when the altar server rings the bell the people get up and they go out once again mm. right go out and then into the boutique in front of the church and have a cup of tea and come back and this is very <laughs> wrong this is very wrong in fact the most important moment is yet to come that is the doxology Yeah. The doxology, the through him and the with him, because this is an act of praise and thanksgiving within this sacrificial ritual. The act of praise and thanksgiving comes to the climax with the doxology mm -hmm. through him, with him. I told you uh, a little while ago that uh, from the beginning there was only one elevation. Yeah, that was the doxology. Mm. no other elevations for there at the beginning this elevating the host and the Cup. the yeah. chalice came mm. after the 11th century we can go into a little bit of history about that but let me finish the structure so we have uh, the epiclesis that's called the epiclesis the first epiclesis mm -hmm. so that uh, the bread becomes the body and the wine becomes the blood but it is not only one moment mm. once again i reiterate that mm. then we have uh, the words of consecration yes over the bread and over the wine yes then we have the memorial acclamation yes yeah. we proclaim the paschal mystery right uh that's an important proclamation there are three formats i think three yeah, yeah. formats there are there are options, options there are yeah. options given then we have what is called the anamnesis right anamnesis is when we really call to mind actually calling to mind is a very loose way of translating this mm. you can't calling uh, you can't translate that as a calling to mind Mm. right you can't say it is remembering it is actually making it really alive and present here and now yeah what happened those days mm. right it is only after that that we have the offering now you might wonder what what now we had the offered reposition we had the offerings brought to the altar no it's actually now that we offer the perfect Offering. the perfect offering of the to. body and blood of the son to the father to the father hmm. right then we have the second epiclesis hmm. asking invoking the holy spirit once again this time not to make the bread the body of christ and the wine the blood of christ hmm. but to make the people of god the body of christ right there is a beautiful theology mm. if i forget please remind me yeah. we will have to talk about it we will have to talk about it uh, the the beautiful connection between the first epiclesis and the second epiclesis the first invoking of the holy spirit and the second mm. invoking of the holy spirit then we come to the prayer of the church prayer for the church sure. rather yeah and prayer for the church is divided into two we pray for the living Mm -hmm. we pray for the dead mm -hmm. right when we pray for the living that also is subdivided into two we pray for the church leaders and for the participants okay. right then we pray for the dead yeah because they are also part of the communion of saints mm. 
We must remember that they are part of the communion of saints, right? And that's why we pray for them. Mm. They, the saints pray for us. We pray for the dear departed, right? And then finally we have the, what I told you a little while ago, the eschatological expectation. What will happen at the end? Mm. With uh, the Blessed Mother, the Apostles, we will once, one day enjoy this heavenly bliss. Mm and the doxology. Doxology is what will sum up everything through him, with him, in him. Mm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, to God the Father in the Holy Spirit. And all of us will burst into this endorsement. No, endorsement. Amen. Now you see how complex is the last T? It is. Yes. Right? And now I have just, uh, you know, run through it, scan yeah. through it. I think we should recall that structure that we were talking about, right? That kind of yes. graphic. Uh, yes, exactly. Talk about that now? Yes. Now, now, you see, now we had uh, the bringing of the gifts, no? Hmm. That the valley. And the valley. And yeah. then it goes up, 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 up. And then right. the crescendo, the climax, the apex is the doxology. Doxology. Right. Hmm. Uh, Trevor, I, I am trying to uh, emphasize the structure of this prayer. Hmm. Right? It is rather complex it is. because it has a tradition and a theology, hmm. not for any other reason. It is so precious. Yeah. That's why, as a celebrant, I must not be joking around with this. Right? Okay, I say, okay, now uh, I'll do away with the missile, close the book. Close my eyes and I improvise. Okay, I, I, what I pray could be very attractive, mm, very sensational, could be even very timely and uh, you no know, seemingly very relevant. Probably I could say, Heavenly Father, we now pray that you send your holy angels and uh, cleanse our bodies and minds and hearts and uh, you no. Know, uh, purify the whole humanity of this COVID-19 virus uh, and people would be, you know, very, very happy mm -hmm. with something like that. But th this is not the time for th time to do that. Mm -hmm. This is not the time to do that. That type of thing has to be said during the prayers of the faithful. Mm -hmm. Right. Even inside the Eucharistic prayer, there are intercessions, but only for the communion of saints. Right. So that's why I can't just close my eyes and you know start praying for anything and everything. Mm. There is a classic example. I don't want to mention the place and uh, the details about it. Uh, during a feast uh, uh, to Saint Anne, mm. you know, somebody started uh, improvising and uh, praying for grandmothers because Saint Anne is the grandmother of Jesus. Yeah. Right, okay, close the book and say, now we'll pray for our grandmothers. Mm -hmm. Now, what is really you know, problematic here is, what should have been done At during the prayers of prayer the faithful, faithful is brought to this one, mm -hmm. which is actually a dislocation and a deformity. Mm -hmm. Right, so there is a technical side to this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And unless we understand that, we as celebrants, very humbly, we must understand that, accept that. And then the faithful must understand that this is not a prayer which uh, can be, you know, improvised at uh, one's own uh, women fancy. You know, it's not right. possible mm -hmm. because it is so sacred. Yeah. Now, for example, there are certain formulae which people pronounce and every word must be pronounced properly. You know, for example, let's say an oath taken by a president of a country hmm. before, let's say, the, oh, uh, maybe the chief uh, justice, chief of, justice the, of the country. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Do they change, improvise? No. <laughs> Not a word. Not a word is changed. You can't. You can't. Right. Or somebody taking an oath no, after going through some lengthy training, there are ceremonies, no? Yeah. And do you change the formula? No, you can't. Hmm. No, you can't. Maybe what 
you have within you the creativity, uh, with that creativity you could say something better, but you are not allowed to do that. No. And uh, the person, however powerful, however intelligent, however qualified that person uh, uh, may be, even he or she doesn't uh, now uh, say, okay, now close that book, let me uh, formulate my own oath. Mm. No, certainly no. Similarly, within the Mass, this is that prayer. Mm. This is that sacred prayer. This is that central prayer. Now, my invitation to our faithful is that uh, we take more interest in this prayer, right? And now, you say, oh, Father, this is too much, too technical, too theological. Sure, there is uh, the theological part of it, the traditional part of it. How many other difficult things we study and read about these days now, right? If we are really interested, mm. Right, we can study the Eucharist, take the prayer book, the mass prayer book, right? Mm. We have the prayer cards, just go through that and just go through that and see whether you can identify some of these things, mm. right? Now, Trevor, coming to some important things here, let me only, uh, with the time available, let me only uh, uh, pinpoint to a few things, right? The, wor the work of the Holy Spirit. Right. Right? Because this is something, this aspect is not uh, spoken of and discussed sufficiently. Mm. It's called the epiclesis. No? Epiclesis. Epiclesis. The invocation of the Holy Spirit. Now see, in the first instance, the bread is transformed into the body, body. and wine into blood. Blood of Christ. Right? And uh, the result is the body of Christ, hmm. right? Uh, through the action of the Holy Spirit, the result is the body of Christ. Hmm. Then in the second instance, the second epiclesis, we pray that together the people of God, different as we are, right, some are, uh, educated, some are not so educated, some are rich, some are not so rich, you know, some are black, some are not black. We form the body of Christ, that we are now formed into the body of Christ through the action of the Holy Spirit. Now see the importance of this uh, particular epiclesis. Hmm. When we come to receive communion, my dear weavers, my brothers and sisters, what does the priest say? We say, the, the body, body of, of Christ. Christ. Not the now body what of is, Jesus. Sorry, sorry? Not the body of Jesus. No, no, no. We the say body the body of Christ. Of Christ. Yes. And that's very important. Very important. Those who are <laughs> distributing communion can never say Jesus mm. or the body of Jesus. Mm. No, the body of Christ. Yes. Because the body of Christ is not only the consecrated host. It is the body of Christ that is the people of God. Mm -hmm. So when we say Amen and receive this host onto my tongue, I'm saying, yes, I receive the consecrated host, which is the body of Christ, and the body of Christ, which is the people of God. Right? Mm -hmm. right? I don't if, think we are aware of the second aspect. Exactly, of exactly. People are only only, I think, uh, 99 cases out of 100, yeah, I, think so. I think people are thinking of this yeah. small host, consecrated mm. host, which I devoutly receive, fine, very good, yeah. very devoutly received, but it is the body of Christ, now I have received Jesus, right. but it is only one part, of 50% of the story. Mm. Mm. What about the body of Christ, which is through the action of the Holy Spirit, Spirit. now, the body of Christ. Mm. I become part of that. Communion is that. Mm. I commune the body of Christ, which is also the consecrated host and mm. the people of God. Mm. Now what happens is I consume the body of Christ, which is the consecrated host, but I have nothing to do with the people of God, mm. which is actually discrepant, yes. which is actually a contradiction. Because if I cannot actually commune with the people of God, my receiving the body of Christ, 
is actually a kind of a you know mm. very poor exercise that I do yeah. that I go through, right? Therefore, these theological theological uh, nuances are extremely important when we go through this Eucharistic prayer, mm. right? There are others. The other thing now coming to uh, the memorial acclamation. Yeah, we proclaim directly the passion, death and the resurrection coming again of Jesus Christ. Yes. And in fact, this is the, the only place where it is directly mentioned within the Eucharistic prayer. Yes. And this is typically Christian, mm -hmm. not Jewish. Mm. Right? The Jews don't believe that part of the story. No. No. And therefore, uh, within a typically Jewish traditional, technical, theological prayer, we bring in what is typically Christian, right. the Paschal mystery Christian. of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. which is at the center of all liturgy. Mm -hmm. And if you take the Paschal mystery out, there is no liturgy. So we must, we must highlight that, emphasize that, and that's why that has to be preferably sung a joyful acclamation and that's why it should not be replaced with any other chorus. Right. Now, in English, Master Trevor, we very often hear, He is Lord. He is Lord. Oh, come let us adore Him yeah. during Christmas. No, no, no. This is, this is not Eucharistic adoration. No. Right. He is Lord is a beautiful chorus. Hmm. But it is, the content doesn't have the Paschal mystery. No. Right? So, the only place where the Paschal mystery is directly mentioned must be respected very faithfully. Mm. Right? That's why some of these things must be rectified. rectified. And why can't we sing that Father? We can't because no. the content is not there. Mm. The expected content is not there, absent. Yeah. Then we come to the intercessions, right? I told you we are praying both for the living and for the dead. dead. Now, it doesn't mean that we pray for anything and everything. Hmm. This is exclusive, exclusive hmm. in the sense it's only for the baptized community. Right. It's only for the communion of saints hmm. because the prayers of the faithful uh, are meant to pray for anyone, anyone. inclusive, Means. outside mm. the communion of saints. Yeah. Now, for example, these Proper days we can pray or... for those who are suffering from COVID-19 COVID. yeah. and they need, need not be baptized Christians or Catholics. No. We can pray for anyone, mm. right? We can pray for people suffering, let's say, uh, in Afghanistan. Oh, we can pray for people uh, who are suffering from uh, you know, wildfires burning in, uh, let's say, the United States or mm -hmm. somewhere else. Mm -hmm. We can pray that. Yeah. Pray, pray those, no problem. Yeah. But when it comes to the Eucharistic prayer, mm -hmm. it is limited, restricted, right? And it is targeted. And if we started exaggerating there, once again, we are going away, going at a tangent. We are actually beside the mark once again. For example, mm. in November, Trevor, if we start elaborating on the people's names. Yeah, right? long length of diseased people's names. Okay, I think uh, we should continue with this maybe a little next time also. Mm. But uh, for the time being, let me uh, you know, bring this to... Uh, uh, close, yeah. but at least, my dear viewers, it's very important that we understand that this is a very important theological, precious, traditional, holy, technical prayer. Right. So, that uh, brings us to the end of today's episode. Uh, dear viewers, uh, I'm, I'm sure you uh, learned a lot about it and uh, you would understand better now when you participate in the Holy Eucharist and particularly the Eucharistic prayer. All this time you may be wondering what to do about it. Well, you now understand how important it is and how important you are in praying together with the priest this prayer 
I mean, it's in silent you join in this prayer because it's a prayer that is very much part of the body of Christ, which is yourself also. So thank you very much, Father, for that enlightening discussion. And let's, I think, take off uh, a little yes. more on that in the next episode. Right. And we will uh, go into the balance of the Eucharistic prayer and the rest of the Eucharist in the next episode. And from me, it is God bless you. Thank you.